It's 10 p.m. on a Saturday night, and we're live with Track Talk. I hope everyone, Track Talk fans, are having fun. We know some of the supporters club members are out at the bars because they invited John and I to partake, but not everyone can be in Boston for the 2240 NCAA Championships. John's given me a very nice, exclusive beverage to drink, and I'm excited to be here. 2024 NCAA Championships are in the book, John's. Fun meet. I'd never been to the track at New Balance. Amazing facility to have a track like in the middle of Boston. Cool facility. But Nico Young, the guy that was looked like he was going to be Nico Young, the guy that looked like he was going to be the next Chris Derrick, great runner, super consistent, never wins an NCAA title, is now an NCAA distance god. Parker Volby. She's the distance goddess. Jesus. I mean, she's won, what, one, two, three, four straight NCAA races in a row for dating to outdoors last year? Reminds me of someone else who did that, Robert. Caitlin Tui, right before. Caitlin Tui wins NCAA outdoors, wins NCAA cross country, then wins two in NCAA indoors. And immediately, Parker Valby does the exact same thing. Wins NCAA outdoors wins NCAA cross country, wins two at NCAA indoors. Except, well, I guess they're both really impressive. Caitlin Tui broke some collegiate records. Parker Valby's broken some collegiate records. Broke meet, meet records. But She's just been phenomenal. Yes, but it reminded me, Tui, good thing you went pro. Do we think Tui would really be touching Valby right now? Tui versus Valby, message borders. I got to go with Tui. I mean, I, I got to go with Valby right now. But – they were amazing. We'll talk about that. In the mile, we have two studs. Luke Hauser, back-to-back champion. All we hear on Let's Run all spring was Nathan Green's the most talented guy, etc. Well, Luke Hauser's won two in a row. If you're listening to this podcast, do you know who was the last NCAA person to win two indoor mile champions in a row? I'll tell you later on in the podcast. NCAA 800 meter champions upset in both. Juliet Whitaker of Stanford, the runner up last year, moves up to number one, upsetting outdoor champion Michaela Rose. And the unheralded Rivaldo Marshall of Iowa, the fifth placer at the Big Tens, has won the men's 800 meter title. But my favorite interview of the day was with the runner up, Sean Dolan of Villanova. I'm probably biased because I'm a dad and a father, but cool interview. We'll talk about that. Texas Tech men and Arkansas women have won. And, you know, there was some interesting sprint action. Terrence Jones, 60, wins the 60 and the 200. We'll talk about that. John was disappointed in the trick in the sprint action this year. I feel like the sprint action, like normally we've got someone like Britton Wilson doing amazing things or Christian Coleman when he was in college, Grant Holloway, Sidney McLaughlin, Lavroni. Even a thing, Mo stepping down, she did get beat when she ran the 400 indoors, but it just doesn't feel like, you know, did we have a collegiate record this year in the sprints? No. You know, we, we had some, I'm sure there will be some very good professional sprinters coming out of this meet, but just feels like last year with the altitude in Albuquerque, we had collegiate records, really fast times. And this year, I don't know whether it's the current crop just isn't, I mean, usually what happens is we get one amazing crop of talent and immediately they're replaced by a bunch of other guys. And right now we've got Christopher Morales Williams of Georgia. That guy's a stud, could win the Olympics this year. But after him, I don't know, is that, you know, who would you look at from this group? I feel like he's kind of the guy, you know, in terms of the sprint studs that we saw in NCAAs this year. Yeah, John has put this. Those of you watching live, John has put the the this. I mean, this thing you've been okay, screwing around down, with my light, lighting setup, and now we're like we're in darkness. I mean, put it I inside. have. Yeah, it's my apartment here. I think I know how to light myself. And Robert comes in and acting like he's some stage director trying to get some lighting nomination at the Oscars tomorrow. So that looks good right there, John. Yeah. Sorry for the lighting difficulties, people. But fun NCAs as always. This was the first sporting event. That my offspring, young six-year-old Clayton Johnson, has attended. He seemed to love the action, John. He's really into it. 
So that was fun. Apparently he was doing a great job picking winners. Takes after his old man. Your wife was telling me like up until I think the relay, he was getting all the events right. Now, Maybe. I don't know if he was making these predictions on the last lap of the race or what, but um, apparently your, your son has a future in this. Might be coming for my job in a little bit. Maybe we should have like a betting betting thing. And he would have to be masked. My wife does not want his face on the internet, but you know, Clayton, who's going to win this race? I shouldn't even get his name. Now people are going to Google him, stalk him. But speaking of being stalked, I felt like I was stalked. John, do you get this? John is a professional. He stays in the mix zone most of the time. My wife, my my college buddy, Chris Lear, author of Running Buffalo, his family was there. So I was going into the stands, and I was being mobbed by supporters club members. They demanded that I have a drink with them. I didn't have time because John, John is very good. Like, if I'm gone from the mix zone for more than about 15 minutes, I'll get a call. Like, where are you? you yeah, and you know what else I'm good at? Keeping us on track. People don't really want to care about hear about the life no, and they, times of Robert Johnson they, at the NCAA meet. Some people recognized Robert. Amazing. At an NCAA indoor championships – where people are paying to watch track and field, that they might recognize the owner of the most prominent track and field website. John, I had it, it, it's shocking, truly. Had, Especially when he's wearing a Let's Run.com t-shirt. And we did see some Let's Run.com t-shirts in the stands. It was lovely. But can we please talk about the meat, Robert, as opposed to who met you or who wants to buy you a beer? It's not just about me, John. I had a lady ask, where, where's John been? By the yeah, way, right. he was at a soccer match, Brighton versus Roma. We didn't want to get it out because he was sitting in the Roma section, but it didn't matter. His supporting of Brighton did not work out so well. Four nil, John. Yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Not being an expert, it looked like two goals were offsides. Anyways, third goal was offside. I stand by that. All right, All right let, let's start with Nico Young because we knew Volby was amazing coming in, and but Nico Young, I mean, I guess it's a little, well, he did run a twelve fifty seven seven prior to this meet to get the NCAA record, which is. He's the only collision ever to break 13 minutes. So that's good. But, it, you know, if he loses this meet and whatever, I do think he ends his career as like the guy, you know, like a Chris Derrick, like really good runner, American, who was a badass from freshman year, but just doesn't have the kick. And then you, if you don't have the kick, it's like, well, what are you going to do as a professional? I was thinking the same exact thing, Robert. That's one of my takeaways is, not only was this a tour de force performance by Nico Young, both in the 5K on Friday and the 3K tonight, he closed both those races in 154 for his last 800. 154.0 tonight in the 3K, just absolutely sensational. Not just that, but this raises the ceiling for what he can do as a pro because I'm like you. I'm like looking at what he can do in the track. And if you don't have a kick, you really just can't be a factor in the 5K or the 10K at a global level. You need to be able to close. That's how the medals are won in championship races. And before this season, I really hadn't seen the evidence this guy had that. Remember this meet last year in Albuquerque, I talked to Nico after the three, 5K. Him and Drew Bosley were trying to push the pace because they just thought that's our best chance at winning. We're not big kickers. They knew that. Now he can kick. And... Not only that, he's closing in 154 in a race where he set the meet record. He ran 741. That wasn't a slow race. And he's just, he rips off a 58-3 and then he goes 55 for his last 400. Just sensational. So now I'm like, all right, this guy might, you know, maybe he's never going to be a Paul Chalima or Woody Kincaid, but this guy, I think, is probably going to be strong enough to be in contention and be able to kick you know possibly for a spot on the olympic team this summer or if not a couple years down the line remember he's only 21 years old so not just a great win for him in the short term but raises the ceiling for what he can do as a professional and i think the comparison that came to mind is a guy by the name of galen rupp 2009 what was the reputation going into galen's senior year at oregon zero ncaa titles got out kicked when it mattered in ncaa cross and we were like, you know, is this guy going to f- forever be this ballyhooed prospect who's run some very, very fast times but has never won an NCAA title? He totally changes the narrative. He wins NCAA cross. He goes to indoors, wins the 3K, 5K, and wins the DMR, anchoring that. Just a t- phenomenal thing. And it's like he sprang out and he suddenly had a kick and he goes on to medal on the track and become this superstar and is a factor in global finals. And I feel like 
Nico Young, it's the same thing. Going into this, I didn't think of Nico Young as a kicker. And now I'm like, suddenly he has a kick and he might be relevant. Yeah, although he's taking it from a little bit. It's not like he's waiting to the last 200. But that's, that's, that is true. But it, as long as you look, can, if you can go from 600 to 400, that's you know that's what chipped the guy. To does. me, the eye-opening thing was once you ran an altitude mile and destroyed Colin Solomon by like more than a second, and then Solomon the next week ran – so the mile converted to like 348 or 349. Yeah. And then the next week, Solomon ran like 352 or something. I was like, okay, this is legit. And it's, it's weird. I, we've been working on our stuff. I pull up the message board post to page five of, you know, the message board thread on the meet. This is the, I, I'm just, I literally just opened up my computer because we were using John's. The top of the first post by – Beard, beard, bird, bird, bead, excuse me. It was exactly what you were saying. Nico is in the next in line, Galen, Robin, Grant Fisher. And that's, you know, kind of what we're thinking right now. And I know Sean Brosnan is extremely high on Nico's talent level. Like he's like, Nico set the stage for all of the other guys after him. That's what he believes. And, you know, the good news is, I think there's a much higher likelihood that Nico is not on any sort of testosterone boost or anything like that. And it's actually interesting that Brosnan was his high school coach because Brosnan has got, I would say on friendly terms with Alberto, Jerry, Mike Smith, all these people, he knows them all. He's got a little bit of influence from so many people, but congrats to Nico. Absolutely. Unreal. Really? I mean, it's just insane. Can we also give a shout out to Parker Wolf? Because, um, he was mag- he just dominated the ACC meet. He like ran a three fifty four mile. Is it like a three k five k guy at the ACCs? One also the three k. And I um landed with my family yesterday. I missed the men's portion of the meet yesterday, and I'm watching the five thousand on my phone. And there's the new Ugandan from Africa, Peter Maru, leading. He's a beautiful runner. My God, he look, doesn't he look magnificent, John. He's doing most of the leading, but there's no sound. And then, okay, what's going to happen here? I'm looking for Nico. And Wolf just took it with what, with 400 to go, I think it was. So, man, he's going for it. Maybe could Wolf win this thing? And then Nico came back and got him. But those two were miles ahead of everybody else. And then today, Nico pushes with 600 meters to go, really gaps the field. The only one close is Wolf, and in the last lap, particularly between 200 and 100, I'm like, oh, he's gaining. He might catch Nico. Didn't quite get there. They both kind of tied up, I would say, equally the last 50, maybe? They, they had the exact same last lap, 28.03. So I think what happened, it seemed like, was Nico gained a little on him at the, at the start of the lap, and then Parker pulled it back a little and but never could get closer. But yeah, Parker Wolf was... Clearly better than everyone else at this meet, and he only got beat by a, just a sensational athlete in top form right now. So he deserves a lot of credit. Also, I guess the one interesting thing about this, though, Robert, is remember in December, Graham Blanks won the NCAA cross country title for Harvard. Who? And then he comes in and oh, Graham runs thirteen oh three, sets a collegiate record. We're starting to think Graham Blanks. He's beating everyone. He was had an undefeated cross country season. Beat all the major players at Nutty Comb and then again at NCAA's. Runs a collegiate record. We're starting to be like, could Graham Blanks be on the Olympic team? Like NCAA's are in Boston. Think how good he can be. And w- were we being prisoners of the moment with Graham? Are we being prisoners of the moment now? Him and Nico are both twenty one. They're both big talents. But we now we're saying. We went from saying Nico Young, I don't think he's ever going to be a factor on the track, or it was sort of percolating in the back of my mind to like, now this guy could be making the Olympic team this summer. Are we overreacting? Because I, I, what he did was really impressive, but we were really high on blanks a few, you know, just a few months ago, and probably still should be, right? Well, I'll, I'll take it a step farther. And this is the, this is what I add to my beloved brother, Weldon Johnson, who is working behind the scenes tonight. And was the key to our let's run, our our instant coverage last night. By the way, I said I skipped the men's meet. I also skipped the women's meet too last night, John. I just did not make it day one. <laughs> okay, but we are being prisoners of the moment because 
I added this to Weldon's recap last night. Uh, remember NC Outdoors last year in Austin? Like Kai Robinson, who's ever going to beat him? Right? Kai Robinson wiped the floor of everybody in NCAA in the 10 and the 5. I'm like, how does that, how could anyone ever beat that guy in NCAA race? And then he loses cross, he loses here. It's the same thing with Nico Young, similar thought process. How could he ever win an NCAA race? Like, is he ever going to win one? And now it's like, how did he ever lose? Like, so I do think this is one thing I think of is fun about college. Because they're in the developmental age still. Like, we don't really see that in pros, do you? Do you really see, like, a guy that you think is never going to win all of a sudden become dominant? Well, Mo Farah. Mo yeah, Farah. Does, doesn't happen too often. And, <laughs> and, and it was just really interesting on that front. But speaking of which, I had a, a wonderful interview with Robinson after the race. And I was like, well, you know, what do you think? He was so upbeat. He's like, I really think I'm significantly ahead of where I was last year. And last year, I think he was 10th and 7th in these two races. And, Grant, and by the way, Grand Blanche was terrible in this race last year. And this year, he was like 5th and 3rd. And he said, and I did World Cross last year. I felt my, my, some time. I, I just think I, I'm ahead. And he said, Nico is really good. So he's got the long-term view. And it really reminds me of how Nico Young was in the fall. Like, Nico gets what sixth and cross, which is bad for him. Like he's been second before. Well, Mike, Mike Smith has admitted this. You know, he talked to him. He's basically, I think he got the peak wrong. Like he he kind of saw, you know, he tries to peak them for NCAA cross in November. And then Nico was running so well early indoors that he was kind of like, oh man, you know, this guy could have been a little bit better at cross. Uh, if, if I, you know, I think he took some blame for that. But, you know, Mike Smith doesn't make that many mistakes. He's still a pretty great coach. But I think the larger point here, Robert, is there are a ton of really good distance runners in the NCAA right now. I think Kai Robinson will be a terrific pro. I think Graham Blanks will be a great pro. I think Nico Young will be a great pro. Parker Wolf, that progression has been terrific. He's gotten better every year. This is his third year at UNC. Yeah, wait, hold on. Yeah, third year at UNC because he was a senior in the COVID year of 2020, 2021. All these guys are super talented. They've made great progress in the NCAA and it's kind of been like, okay, who's healthy, who's had the right training, you know, all that sort of thing. I don't know if I had to pick like who's the most talented of the bunch. It's kind of hard. I think they're all really talented and they're all going to be really good. Stan, the man on, on YouTube says, why does Nico hurt my eyes when I want to, when I watch him run? It's not beautiful. But Paul Radcliffe, one of the greatest of all time, wasn't beautiful. Paul Chalimo is always doing that damn tick. That's not beautiful. So, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be beautiful. But I think Mike, the, goes, Mike Smith says he's worked on his form though. The, the two things I asked Nico is like. By the way, look, we got an interview with Mike Smith off the YouTube. It, it's really interesting, and John does a great job. And that's what I was I was complimenting John before we started the show. I'm like, yeah, some of the interviews you like really ask good questions. Like John's like, he's like, oh, I've been working on his form. John's like, what specifically were we working on his form? So John can talk about the race stuff, but what was fascinating to me. And I used to think this when I run, I just kind of like flop my leg, my foot down. I don't really think about it. Listen to this Mike Smith interview. He's, he's like, yeah, we want, we, he was basically kind of saying the same thing. You just kind of run through your foot. And he's like, I'm trying to teach them to like place their foot and push off of it. Well, I feel it like it was like fascinating. You think about that more with sprinters. Like he's saying, you put more if you put more force into the ground, you're going to get more power off of it. It's, I'm like, okay, I would think about that with a sprinter. I wouldn't think about that at a distance runner on his easy run, which is something you know. It sounded it kind of sounded like that was something they were working on either on even on easy runs. So yeah, there were. Two, Weldon's got a great question. We'll, wait, get, wait, wait. we'll get here in a second. But the two things that both Mike and Nico said how this kick sort of magically appeared was one, it didn't just appear overnight. This was a process over a couple of years of him gaining strength. And this is the old strength is speed adage that Nico Young's always been able to run, you know, a 53 or 54 second 400. It's just now he is strong enough that he can access that speed late in the race. So that's something, you know, we've heard from other coaches as well. You just have to be strong enough to get to the point where you're not feeling that tired with 400 to go. And the other thing was this overhauling his form, his mechanics to impart more force in the ground. That Those are the two explanations they gave for why he suddenly is a monster at end of races. By the way, I never thought this until Grace 
in truth has posted a doping allegation nico saying nico is clearly on nico bear says he barely trains wins the altitude race drastic time difference since last year nico's blood doping which is kind of ironic but on a serious note i'd bet my life that nico young is clean this makes me think like when rob developed a kick then he didn't have a kick i'm like okay this is suspicious as hell this guy is trained by a guy who's part of the athletics west who we know has testosterone in his bag there's like Nike documents saying it was testosterone. And then all of a sudden he's about to go pro. If he develops a kick and starts winning NCAAs, like Alberta's going to get a lot of money from the NLP and he develops a kick in his NCAAs. That was highly suspicious to me. The fact that Nico Young, who I believe is clean, is doing this makes me think, oh, wait, maybe Ruff was much more highlight. Right now, I never thought it was much more highlighted that Ruff was clean than before tonight. I still think I'll never trust the fact that Alberto had testosterone in his back. But Weldon has an interesting comment here. Yes or no, uh, Weldon, excuse me, a guy by the name of Weldon Johnson on YouTube. I think I know who that is. Um, says, will, yes or no, will Nico Young make the Olympic 2024 Olympic team? He will make the Olympic team if one thing happens, and it needs to happen next weekend. Damn it, this was my take, but it's a smart one. Go ahead. Nico Young is in the goddamn form of his life. There's a race called The Tent. It's a 10,000 meter qualifier. It's set up perfectly under perfect conditions with perfect rabbits to run under 27 flat, which is not easy to do. And if you run under 27 flat, you're eligible to run the 10,000 Olympics. If you don't run under 27 flat, you're not eligible unless you go to a bunch of cross country races, which no Americans have gone to. So, Nico Young, uh, I had heard that he wanted to run the 10. And then we asked him about it um, tonight. And he said, What, John? He said, "You'll fi- everyone will find out in a few days." So because look, his quick- name was on the start list when they first announced it, and then they took it off, and it's because they knew he was running two races at NCAA indoors, and the well, races stop. Are- stop. Nico said he wants to run the ten thousand of the trials, and I, as a fan and former coach, I pleaded with Mike Smith after off off camera. We got a great interview with Mike Smith on the camera. And then afterwards, I like got to him. I'm like, look, dude, do not overcomplicate this. This guy is in the goddamn form of his life. Just let him jog all week, do a couple sessions of strides, and let him race the 10. Because Nico's like, I want to run the 10 at the USA's, 10,000. So he needs the standard. And Mike's like, this is the best standard. Mike's like, yeah, I've got the devil and, and, the, and Jesus and, and my, these kind of competing things in my head. I'm like, no. Do not overthink this. Well, Maybe he doesn't want competition for his. Does he have other guys in the ten? I don't know. Man. Well, he has Woody Kincaid in the ten. Um, no, no, and, no. And he, he there is, was a post on, on on YouTube earlier tonight. It says right this whole thing right now. And I agree with this sentiment. That either is like someone said, Nico would destroy Joe Clucker. This is bad news for Joe Clucker because Nico Young is like I view him as a strong dude that just pushes, 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 and now he has a kick. I think he's beating Clucker in whatever he runs. I, I never understood why they, it was shocking to me that they were going to build this OAC team around Clucker. My Clucker can't win anything. Now, Clucker's done well and beaten Fisher a lot of times. Well, Clucker's been good the last couple of years. Clucker has been bad this indoor season. Like, And if he doesn't turn things around, yeah, Nico Young's going to be taking that spot that he's had in the 10K the last few years. But, it's just, I, I think he has to run the 10 because I'm, Chris Derrick, how many times has he brought this up in his career? He's like, 2012, I was in great shape, you know, and I go to the Olympic trials and I get fourth and I thought, okay, I was fourth, but four years from now, I'll do better. You know, maybe four years after that, he'll do better. Chris Derrick, that was as close as he ever came to making an Olympic team. That was his best. That was his senior year at Stanford. That was the best shape he was ever in. And Mike did acknowledge that. He's like, you know, but Olympics, blah, blah, blah. But it may be a little bit much. It may put him a little bit in a hole. But if you get the 27 flat standard, Such an advantage. your odds are like 80% higher. So th- to me, this is kind of like the December meet in cross country. You peak for cross country, just rest up, run the December meet, and then rest up and see what happens after that. He, Honestly, he could just do nothing. He could skip NCAA outdoors, go pro, sign the big de- – run 26.50 next weekend, go pro, never run NCAA again, and just get ready for the trials. Like, he would make the team. So – Please, he's got. It. If they don't do that, to me, it's coaching mismanagement. Should he just turn pro today, Oswaldon Johnson? I mean, depends. Yes. Depends what the offer is. If you like, if he's got a big time deal, uh, and you can do that before the ten, 
Bro, I mean, that's it's, that's a quick turnaround. That's a lot of stress. No, on this I play, would, but... no, I would not do it before the ten. I, I want to sign the deal. But and we'll talk about my Rams. Yeah, if he gets if he gets a big time deal, yeah, he's already got the NCAA titles that he wants. He's already won cross in with his team multiple times. It would be cool for him to win cross as an individual, but. Again, he's in the shape of his life. If you get a huge deal and you can focus on just making the Olympic team, I, I wouldn't be opposed to him doing that in time pro right now. But speaking of which, we don't know the value of these NILs. I had heard from a – He doesn't have an NIL. I think he's with Adidas. Nico Young? Yeah. When did he announce that? I don't think it might have been announced, but I think he's with Adidas. And – what? Anyways, I, I thought he had an NIL deal with Adidas. Isn't isn't all these guys have any deals? You win NCAA. I know. I, I thought Nico Young famously did not because his brothers. Remember, his brothers got an NIL deal and okay. he didn't have one. Maybe I got think, confused with them. Someone in the comments. I don't. I don't. Th I don't think he has a deal. But if you know of him having an NIL deal with a shoe brand, let me know. Speaking of which, I was told of, you know a couple months ago that like okay, the NIL deals like they're not really much, particularly for men. They're like very low level, and then. Since then, someone else has told me, no, Robert, you know what you're talking about. Um, this was a prominent coach. So, like, I know of an athlete that's on an IO deal and in the same tax bracket as me. So, that would be six figures. Okay. Uh, anyway, we, we need to. There were other athletes at this meet. It is very exciting. So, Nico Young is like a classic let's run hype train. This guy was a stud in high school, part of a very prominent program, goes to NAU. He's a golden boy of American distance running. I mean, it is, I got to say, it is cool to see athletes like this get an NCAA title. Obviously, you. But you after want, four years. You, it, no, you it, like it, having the underdog stories, but also like someone like this was what we were saying about Caitlin Tui a couple of years ago. Right. Remember, her and Nico were the same NCAA class. And coming out of high school, one of the questions was, well, what's the over under for an NCAA title for these athletes? And we put it at about one half. We said like 50 50, maybe. They could turn out to be great and win and they could just, you know, it could never happen for them because that's sometimes what happens. And not only have both of them won multiple NCAA titles, they've also set collegiate records. Both of them have just been fantastic. And it's nice to see, you know, someone who shines so bright in high school, they go to a top program, have a good coach, maybe had a couple struggles. Nico Young has been pretty consistent his whole career. Caitlin Tui. After initially, you know, coming off the injury her freshman year, she was pretty great throughout as well. But, you know, it's never 100% smooth. They don't come in and dominate right away. They take their lumps. They get beat a few times. And guess what? They keep getting better. And now they're NCAA champions. And you're like, hey, the future is bright for American distance running. And yeah. And, but, and, but also to hear Mike explain that, like, how can he get the kick? He's like, well, he's got the speed. He just never could access it. It was just, it's great. Four years in, right? This is his correct. This is his fourth year of college. So congrats to him. All right, Parker Volpe. I mean, we 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 knew she was good, obviously. NC outdoor, NC cross. Tui was sick, but it, it, okay. It's like it, it reminds me of Josh Kerr versus Jockey Benson for Ingebrigtsen. If Kerr wins the Olympics this year over Ingebrigtsen, we're not going to be like, oh, Kerr. You know, we're not going to be like, oh, Ingebrigtsen was sick last year. We're going to be like, Kerr's just better. Volpe was sensational. Fourteen fifty two. And I don't even know if the time was tonight, but 8.41. I think she set a meet record. Yeah, it was like 8.41, something like that. It, it She's just like on another level. And, and the fact that she's watching the triple jump in the middle of a 5,000 where she runs 14.52 is wild to me. So officially 8.41.50 tonight. Olivia Mark. Marcus Wait, she didn't? Oh, she only barely broke the meet record. I mean, this, this woman who used to have the record – Someone by the name of Jenny Barringer, she turned into a pretty good professional runner. That's actually crazy. 2009, Jenny Barringer, now Jenny Simpson, 842.03, not super shoes, setting the uh, meet record. Jessica Lutz, that's Jessica, is that her married name, maybe? Jessica Hull. I mean, she has the facility record from earlier. Anyway, um, I mean, honestly, tonight was really impressive, obviously, but yesterday, I feel like what she did yesterday almost deserved a black page on Let's Run. When it, please let me know the next time anyone, male or female, front solos a 
collegiate record in NCAA 5,000 meter right. final. Put it up. That well, might not happen again for 30 or 40 30. years. When is that ever going to happen again? No, you got to go back in time. You need a fucking time machine to go back to, to Henry Rono. Like, well, to put the black page up now. That's a good point. Solo, no rabbits. I've always said it's easier to time trial indoors because there's no win, but there's only wow, I didn't think about that. That'd be like a guy running 1254 by himself. Yeah. I mean, she dro- she dropped everyone except Taylor Rowe off on the 400 meters. Bow down to I her. mean, it was, it was one of the most ridiculous performances I've ever seen. I can't believe it because, Robert, I don't know about you. A mile ago in that race, I'm like, Taylor Rowe is winning this race. She was in great form coming yeah. in. She was right on Valby. I was like, she's going to sit on Valby. And Valby, we don't know if she has a big kick because she just gets in these fast races. And, and we- Taylor Rowe, I know, has a good kick. She's going to win. And then as soon as that happened, no, but John, just drops the no, but, it, but it wasn't one mile in. Taylor Rose her credit. We got to give her a lot of credit. She stalked there almost for 4,000 meters, like 3,800 meters. Like, you're right. You're like, oh, my God, she's still here. They're running fast. And then Volby, look at the splits in the recap. Like, it was like 36s for like eight laps, 35s for like 34. It was insane what she did. And then she said afterwards, it was like six or seven. On an effort scale. Tonight, the lady question was, on a scale of 0 to 10, how hard was that? And she's like, I hate that question. So she justifiably did not answer that. But – Well, no, was, R- Robert, this woman, she's a running robot, all right? You listen to her in interviews. She's not saying – she just says, I do what Coach Palmer t- tells me to do. Her coach, Will Palmer, at Florida. Like, yesterday, why did she pick up the race at the end? Coach Palmer just said, hey – run faster so she ran faster but, like it, it's it's amazing that she can just be told to do this and then just increase the pace and keep going like i want to see what she can do you throw in her diamond league 5000 this summer pace race you know with professional pacemakers pros to follow behind like she's running 1452 solo the night oh, i'm sorry it was the night before she runs 3000 but it's crazy like it's it's She's just told what she – it's uh, it's blowing my mind. I'm struggling for words for it, but th- she makes it all so simple. It's just like, oh, yeah, I just decided to run faster because coach told me to. That's essentially her race plan for, like, all of these races. But I, I do think, as a former coach myself, the NCAA level, John. John's never even coached anyone at the high school level, but he could. Uh-huh. <laughs> Anyways, I love it because – her love of the coach now, Will Coach Palmer, it, right? She seems to really trust whatever he says. Whereas last year, even when she won in Sea Outdoors, to me, there was like, oh, like it was clearly traumatic. I don't want to say traumatic, but Solinsky left in the middle of the year. And it was like, I'm like, you're running better than ever. Like, how can you not? She was really hard. I think she was hurt last year. Well, she was because I talked to her about this. I was, I was like, are you thinking about the Olympic trials? And she's like, oh, I'm just taking one thing at a time. And I mean, I don't even know how much she follows professional running. Like she's probably never going to hear this and that doesn't really matter. She doesn't need to listen to Let's Run podcast. Um, but I was asking her about the trials and she was like, oh yeah, I was not not really thinking about it right now. And then I said, you know, you didn't run USAs in 2022 or 2023. And she just pointed out, you know, 2022, she barely even knew the, she didn't know USAs were a thing. You know, she was very naive and new to the sport. 2023, she said, you know, she, I, she was like, I was injured. I said, well, you won NCAAs last year, right? She's like, yeah, but I was injured when I did that. You know, you could see me limping. So it, it makes sense why she hasn't done it yet. And now I'm looking, I'm like, she's clearly a contender to make the Olympic team. I don't think she's, I think she can run a lot faster than 1452, but she is going to be challenged by, you know, other women. You've got Monson, you've got Cranny. You've got probably Carissa Schweizer if she can come back and get healthy. Uh, there are going to be other women who are running 1440s or faster. But I also think Parker Valby, if she continues on her current trajectory, maybe could run in the 1440s this spring. So I, I'm fascinated to see what her ceiling is. And I'm really excited. I know this is fast forwarding way ahead, but I just think she's so much better than everyone else in terms of just her capacity to just run away from people in the NCAA that the next real test we're going to see is what happens at the trials and probably not anything in the collegiate season this spring.
by the way, I realize we didn't answer the question whether Mr. Nico Young would make the team. I think if he gets the standard at the 10, he will make the Olympic team. Right now, King Kincaid is number 16 in the world rankings quarter. Clucker is 22. Chilima is 28, and they take 27. No one else has the standard. So, but yeah, it's all about getting the standard. But back to Volby. I mean, I heard a journalist in the mix zone say, like, Daniel Black on YouTube is saying, Ronnie, Volby is so naive that she believes anything. Or she's just that capable and confident. She's not confident. If you listen to her when she broke the collegiate record, when she ran 1456 in Boston, she wasn't confident ahead of those, that race. Like, a lot of times, she needs to be talked into believing in herself. And to yeah, her credit, but, she does. But, but I do think maybe the naivety of, of everything and not knowing. Like, I heard journalists, a journalist asked me in, in the mix zone, like, do you think Parker Volvo even knows who Elise Cranny is? I don't know the answer to that. So, you know, it's like, yeah, she may just focus on herself. And, and This is why I say running robot. She's she's told what to do. She's go faster, go win that race. And she does it. And what I'm interested to see is what happens when she gets thrown in against people who might be better than her. I mean, I speaking, I, of, speaking of which I ran into Tom Radcliffe, the agent. He was sitting like a couple rows. This is the first sporting event my son's ever been to. A couple rows behind my family. And he wasn't trying to like most of the agents were like in the back trying to get new clients. And I think he's just doesn't care anymore. Like about like hobnobbing and kid, like he he's I'm not Parker saying he is a Tom Ratcliffe athlete. I know. Athlete. He's got Parker Valley. Like, why does he need like, like, like he's, but he doesn't need a million clients. He's never wants to do that. I love Tom. He's one of my favorite guys, but um, what was I talking about? Why did I bring up Tom Ratcliffe? Uh, I don't know, Robert. Uh, I might need to cut you off from the beer supply. We we are drinking. Well, there's no free sponsors, but it's a 3.5 percent beer right now, which uh, was probably makes sense after Robert started with the heady top hat. But any, yeah, anything else on this 3,000? Someone did bring up Taylor Rowe in the comments. I mean, that is unfortunate what happened to her. Um, she essentially sounds like she was run over by Amina Martu. So she, I mean, she gets taken out and just has to stop after a lap or two. And this is a woman who's won this race before, who was second in the 5,000 on Friday night. It was in really good shape. If she had run well to her potential, she probably, I think, gets third. And that would have been enough to push Oklahoma State onto the podium for the first time ever on the track for the women's team. So that, you know, that full had big consequences in the team race for them. Uh, it's just yes. unfortunate. I, I hate not seeing athletes be able to realize their potential, whether it was this or whether it was Isaac Baston in the mile prelims. I don't like this double standard we have in the world indoors and, and USA indoors, USA outdoors, whatever. Anytime anyone falls, touches somebody, you get advanced to the next round. Whereas NCAAs, you can get totally like Isaac Baston, there was nothing he could do. I watched the replay of that race. The guy right in front of him falls down, and Isaac goes with him because he, he's right behind him, and it's an indoor mile race. And Instead of being advanced to the final, he just said, sorry, we don't really do that in the NCAA. And I do acknowledge there is potential for this to be abused. Athletes, I feel like it is abused sometimes at the pro level. Someone will just fall and they'll get advanced. I'm like, they weren't going to qualify anyway. And it's, I don't know, there's not an easy fix, but sometimes you got, you got to use, that's why we got to use our brains and use judgment and say, hey, was this guy really materially affected? Was this a legitimate fall? I think when the person right in front of you falls down and wipes you out, that's legitimate fall. Before I die, particularly actually if I die, if I die tragically before I'm like 80, there must be a re-race. In my <laughs> it's in the rule book. You can rerun the race. I would like to see that. Just even in my honor, like Robert Johnson has died. If anyone falls in this mile at the NCAA championship, we're running. By the way, John, while you were going on your monologue, what I was going to say about – Tom Radcliffe is he once told me about Daniel Coleman. He's like, look, when we signed him, he used to be so Tom Radcliffe worked for Kim McDonald had all the top Kenyan guys back in the day. He's like, yeah, they told me like there was this talented guy. And we're going to go meet him. And we drove in this bush. We, we drove like off the roads and back to the bush. And it was going out another, another 30 minutes, another 30 minutes. He's like, after a while, I was pretty convinced I was going to be robbed. I'm like, this is so far, this is so desolate. And then they saw Coleman. And 
He's like, Coleman didn't really have a concept of pace. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, we would just have someone on the infield just say run faster and he would do it. Like he didn't know what a 60 second lap ran. So ignorance is bliss. Coleman, one of the greatest runners of all time. Bobby, one of the greatest runners of all time. I want to give a shout out to Kevin on YouTube. Rojo on beer is like a modern day Socrates. A lot of people think John with a, with a, just a little bit edge off with me. I'm, I'm smarter than normal. Well, so. so Socrates was put to death by drinking poison, Robert. So oh, I, didn't I, say I didn't know that. I, yeah, I don't know. All right, um, let's. Wait, um, anything else from this three K? I mean, Olivia no. Mokasic. I thought it was she got second, second in a row. I thought it was kind of weird that she took the pace because, first of all, Florida essentially had a rabbit for Valby. Flamina Asikol kind of made the pace fast at the start and drops out. Then Mokasic takes over, and I asked her, "I'm like, why'd you do that? You know, Parker always does this, right?" She's basically like, "Look, I kind of knew if I didn't take it, Parker was going to," and she was like. I regretted not taking it in the DMR on Friday night. I knew I I could have done that, and I was hesitant. I sort of trusted my kick too much, and I let the you know she let the BYU team into it. And Riley Chamberlain had a great kick and out kicked her. But this is a woman who slipped four twenty two on their team when they qualified for the DMR. I was like, she only four twenty two four twenty two. She only split four thirty last night, so she had some regrets about this. But, and, it, but she had some regrets about that race. She didn't have regrets about this one. She's like, I went for it. I ran 846. It's a good result. She just got beat by a better athlete. That was interesting because when, when I heard you talking to her, she, we said, what happened last night? She's like, well, I was a little complacent. She's like, oh, I th- you know, I was right there, and I just thought, oh, kick her. She's just thin. She didn't want to rely on the kick now. Because I had a top NCAA coach tell me, if it's close, she can now kick them. So then it's weird. She doesn't trust her kick now today. So she wanted to push the pace. Whereas let's, and this might be a good transition to, to the women's mile. We have Maya Ramsden of Harvard. If you look her up online, she's a 209, 800 meter PB. And John's always criticizing me for saying, look, you always judge someone's kick on the 800 PB. Well, yeah, it doesn't apply. Like Ramsden is a great closer. Several coaches told me that. And you know, it's just not about how fast you are. So it's like certain people like are good at closing. Some, some people aren't. And she, she regretted like sitting on, on the BYU girl who may have a better kick. And and, and you get that concept sometimes. So um, Ramsden, by the way, any, any co- like, like this is Mike Smith. If you're listening right now, well, then put this up on social media. You must run Nico Young tomorrow. Don't tell next weekend at the 10. Don't tell me that it's too much. He's too tired. Maya Ramsden ran world indoors last weekend, John. We were there. Yeah. In Scotland and didn't run. I mean, she ran 426 and two miles in two weekends in a row, but she really wanted to get in the top eight, I believe it was, to get the bonus points or certainly. And she didn't get the bonus points for the rankings to help the Olympics. And I remember when I was joining Rain City Women's PU, I texted the Harvard coach, Alex Gibby. I was like, okay, her 800 meter PB is 209. She got closer. She's like, she's a great closer. Okay, I joke. I kind of sarcastically said, "Why didn't she close at um, World Indoors?" World Indoors, and his response I thought was very smart. Let me look it up on my phone right now. He said, um, "Robert, we're over 500 viewers at the point at this point. This is one of our like highest totals for a live I, show. So I, I, you can't be scrolling to through your phone. You're going to lose the audience. No, Robert. I'm not. They're loving it." He said. Um, but he basically said she, she, that she, she was a little bit tired. You know, she emotionally, like, she turned in her thesis. She makes the final. She didn't recalibrate quick enough. He's like, she'll be fine this weekend. And I'm like, we'll find out. Well, why wasn't she a closer? Because the winning time was like 4.02 or something. Like she's, not, she's just not in shape to run that right now, which is fine. But in the NCAA, winning time, she no, set a meet record. All right, here's the quote from Gibby. A little emotionally tired from the thesis and making finals. Needed to recalibrate quicker. And she did dominated in front of her home in front of like she's from boston she's like i just i I ate at my dorm today it was amazing and her family came in from new zealand she rocked it by the way kimberly may of providence who led most of the race finishes third in pb and they've been racing each other since 14 and they're both very aware of each other they were both excited to see each other up there 425 uh, 13 national record for Ramsden, by the way. Billy Jip Curry of, of Oklahoma State, 427 14. Then Kimberly May, 427 36. And it was cool. I asked May, I said, Well, like, you've been racing here since you're 14. Like, 
what's your career head to head record? And I don't know if she purposely said like what, or she's like, I don't think she understood me. And I'm like, you know, head to head, like who wins? She's like, Oh, I don't think I've ever beaten Maya. So Maya was like thrilled though, to see her country woman in third and said, I hope we make a lot of teams together. It was cool. But NCAA coaches, Mike Smith, you don't have any excuses. If you can go from continent to continent and run and rocket, let Nico Young run next week. Like there's an emotional component, but to me, John, Nico didn't seem like, oh my God, I finally won it. I'm relaxed. The dude seemed locked into me, right? Yeah. Right? Locked in. Like this guy's in the form of his life. He may never be. I'm, I'm almost getting goosebumps just talking about it. He may never be in his form again. He better run the goddamn 10 next weekend. Well, the, the there is that argument that this he may things may never get better. The other argument is this guy's 21 years old. He might just be getting started. I mean, he's 20. I mean, it used to be if you're an American winning these titles, you'd be in like your fifth year or something or sixth year. And Nico Young is a fourth year junior, I think. You know, Graham Blanks, third year. Really, it's his fourth but, year post high school. Like these, <laughs> this is a great crop of American talent right now in the NCAA. By the way, if you're not on the Let's Run, if you don't go to the forum every week, you're missing out. Right now, live, almost 11 p.m. on a Saturday night. John, all the things that have happened on Let's Run. What is super hot on Let's right now? Right now, Gary Mar Garden. Gary Martin got robbed. So Gary Martin, I think, got tripped up at the end of the mile. That's why the Let's Run forum is the best. And I, I want to give a shout out to the forum. Oh, I, he he got. It was about him getting tripped when he wasn't going to like win the race. Like. I was wondering if Gary Martin actually got robbed, like on the streets of Boston. I can understand why that's super hot, but I watched that race. Gary, what was Gary Martin got robbed of? What finishing third? Yeah. By the way, John, the let's run. So I hope their supporters club members. They are clearly having a good time out in Boston. Look at that little people, live viewers. We met them at the meet. I, I do owe them an official apology. I don't. I never got their names. They're from the five. Oh, wait, area code. I'm not sure what that is. But All right. these guys said that Cooper Cheer was leaving the Bowen Track Club. Apparently, a moderator, may have been me, went on there and said, This is not happening. This is fake news. And it did, it did happen. So, normally, whatever you read in the form is true. Apparently, in this case, we said it wasn't true, but it was true. A double apology. Great guys. Hope, guys, don't drink too much. Like, once I got older, I realized you don't want to do the extra, like, two shots, beers, just go home. Robert, I, I didn't realize how much you love attention until you've been texting these guys. You don't even know their names, but they just keep sending you screenshots. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not saying, you know, you people should be questioning your fidelity or something, but it is kind of shocking how, you know, your heart seems to flutter right now just by a few promises but, of alcohol and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, by the way. I'm sure all of you at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night need a better running shoe. You need, need a new running shoe. If you do need one, go to the best shoe site in the world, butterrunningshoes.com, butterrunningshoes.com. Right. Robert, how have we not talked about our favorite event in running, the mile? No, this is what's so amazing about this meet. We've been saving it. We've talked Maya Ramsden. Meet record, by the way, 425.13. I mean, the top three, the top two broke the old meet record. Bill Jeff Curry of Oklahoma State was second. Kimberly May, who's the one driving the pace. Third, Maya Ramsden closed in 61. Ooh, it's just 62 flat, basically. Look, so. men, men's mile, Luke Hauser is repeated, and I tease this. It's called a tease, John, if you're in the audio industry. like Yeah, me. but when you tease, eventually you have to talk about the race. And, and I am. We're Okay, we're at 53 minutes. I just wanted to make sure he was going to get his respect. So we had a 331 guy in this race. Adam Spencer of Wisconsin. But in my preview, I picked Luke Hauser, defending champion number one seed in terms of seasonal best. And he, and he just was great. He, he repeats his champion. And I said at the beginning of the show, who's the last NCAA mile champion to repeat? It's someone by the name of Josh Kurd. Is he any good, John, as a pro? I think I heard that guy. He's been he, He's won a couple of races yeah, recently. Reigning world champion. And look at these other names just – who have won the NCAA mile champion since 2017. So Luke Hauser's won two. Mario Garcia Romo, who ended up getting fourth at Worlds that year. And Cole Hawker, top 
Sixth at the Olympics that year, world indoor silver medalist this year. Yeah. Bef- year before Cole Hawker, well, 2019, two years before there was no COVID meet in 2020. Jordy Beamish. Jordy think, Beamish won a pretty big race last week. Amazing. And then Josh Kerr, double champs in 2017 and 18. By the way, if you're asking him before that, it was Henry Lynn, Edward Cheswick, and Anthony Rotich. But, you know, it was certainly impressive by Hauser, right? Oh, I mean, it was very much what he did last year. This is a guy, he likes running it from the front. He's comfortable there. And last year, he took the lead with three laps to go and just kind of closed it down and got faster each lap and held off all comers. And this year, his coach, Andy Powell, told him, I want you to go to the lead with 800 to go. And he gave him some splits to hit. He basically just said, get faster every lap. He did that to a T. I mean, you could not have executed the game plan any better than what Luke Hauser did. He gets to the lead at halfway, and then he goes 30.19, 28.97, 27.46, 26.82. 26.82. Holds off everyone who tries to come after him. He said, basically, he's like, look, Twice a lap, I was holding off people. On the straightaways, there was always someone who'd come off my shoulder and try to take the lead, and I just fought them off every time. And what this victory showed is, I think, what we have said on this show before, what we said after he won last year, that in a slower championship mile final, particularly indoors, leading is an advantage because it allows you a couple things. One, you... Don't have to worry about jockeying for position. Basically, your responsibility, your sole responsibility, once you get to the lead in the second half of a race, just don't let anyone pass you. Make sure you counter all the moves and just keep the lead. The second advantage is that you get a free run. You're not chopping your strides. You don't have to worry about like someone putting a hand on someone to steady yourself. You don't have anyone in front of you, so you can just run straight ahead, perfect fall and perfect strike. And the third thing, you're running the shortest distance. And... This doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always make the difference, but it certainly helps. Hobbs Kessler at World Indoors last week. Does he get the bronze medal if he's not already in first place at the bell? I'm not sure he does, but he had to run, he had the cleanest ride the way home, and he ends up getting the bronze because he put himself in good position. Right. And the same was true. By the way, and I think if Cole Hawker run that race, he went from the front, he wins it. I think if Norm Norton wins it from the front, he probably wins it. Exactly. Right. And the same is true for Luke Hauser tonight. He did have the fastest last lap in the race, 26.82, but Adam Spencer of Wisconsin had essentially the same close, 26.84. The difference was Adam Spencer was second at the bell, sorry, third at the bell. And to get around Ethan Strand, the guy who was in second, he had to go wide on the back straight. And then he had to stay wide for the start of the first, the final turn. And that meant that he ran 26.84 but he really ran it for like 203 meters or 204 meters. So he probably had a slightly better close than Luke Hauser, but he wasn't in the position that Luke Hauser was. was, And that meant that Hauser got the victory. And same with some of these other guys, like Lucas Bonds, 2690. But did he have to run a little extra distance? Probably. Abel Tefra, Georgetown, 2686. All these guys closed similarly, but I know that Luke Hauser ran exactly 200 meters for that last lap. All these other guys that are bouncing around a little, they're running 26.8, but they're actually splitting a little bit more than 200 meters with the actual distance they cover. So Luke Hauser, he's a good indoor racer. I'm still not sure, like compared to the other UW Milers, I feel like, like how would you rank them in terms of who has the greatest potential? Nathan Green, Joe Waskin, who was eighth in this race, not very impressive, and Luke Hauser. They're all NCAA individual champions. Hauser is the only one with two. I need to have Andy Powell take a truth serum. We heard last year, John, outdoors, that Nathan Green was the most talented. Even the Wisconsin, all the guys were saying that. He barely trains. He can stay healthy. But one of the untold stories we have, I can't believe I brought this up, almost an hour in, is like, there was a lot of NCAA champions that kind of bombed today. Nathan Green, this weekend, Nathan Green, reigning NCAA 1500 meter champion, doesn't make the 100 meter final. Um, last year's NCAA women's 800 meter champion. Oh, Rasheem Willis. Doesn't make the 800 meter final. And, um, Yusuf Bizimana, who won the 800 for Texas indoors last year, didn't make the 800 final. So, uh, 
Yeah, could you be? We have chairman of the boards back in the day. Maybe you're better an indoor runner than an indoor runner. I guess you've got to go. I would honestly, we don't. We said it earlier. We don't want to be too much a man of the moment. And I, I guess I'm going to go with a Wascom or, or a Green. I mean, Wascom did not even make, did not even win indoors or outdoors last year, and still made Team USA. So I'm probably still going to go with all the. I'm not there every day. If all the guys say Nathan Green's the most talented, and I feel like they're probably running in the 800 because they think okay. It's a lumpy gear. We don't want to burn them out. We're working at speed. If I'm a shoe exec, I might think it's green. Yeah, but can he stay healthy? Can he log enough training mm-hmm. to really, you know, especially with the way the 1500s run, run these days? Well, like that's, That would be a similar argument to Jordy Beamish, and he's done okay. Now, there was one interesting thing here. Adam Spencer, 331 last year. Last year, Spencer was challenging for the win at NC Outdoors. I don't know where he ended up. I don't think it was second. Third. And afterwards, in the mix zone, he's like, yeah, I want to make the Worlds team. I'm like, what? Like, what was his PR last year at NCA Outdoors? He's like, dude, you're not making Worlds. You can't even get the close to the standard. Then he goes to Europe and runs 331. So, shame on me. And No, but wait. he Didn't he himself say he didn't know he was in shape to run 331 until he actually ran 331? Cut yourself some no, slack. No, I here. asked him today. I said, hey, are you, how did you use your fitness compared to last year? Are you in 331 shape? He's like, well, I didn't think I was in 331 in shape last year until I ran it. So that's always fun when you run faster. But um, I think Walden's trying to join us, but we don't see him. We see a black screen. But um, anyways, so I said, you know, we talk. He's like, I'm getting ready for the trials. And he said, you know, with 100 meters to go, I felt really good. I thought I had another gear. The problem is with Kowser also had another gear. And um, I don't think he ran an awful race. He was fairly – he was pretty close to the lead. But I think if he was second at the bell instead of third, he might have won that race. Wasn't he in front for most of it? I, I thought he ran smart and it was fine. But I said, hey, off camera, I said, hey, man, you know, I posted this on the forum like a few weeks ago. I was like – you think me as a full-time job would know how the British and Australian trials work, but I don't. So a couple of weeks ago, I'm like, how does it work? I'm not sure if I went back to the thread or didn't get a definitive answer. So I asked him, Hey man, trials are in April. Champs are Australian champs are happen. What happens? He's like, yeah, like I, well, I was wondering that myself. I found this document and I was pretty certain it said that like the top two with the standard at the trials automatically make the team. Which it makes sense. That's kind of what the British have done in the past, right? Third spot's optional. So I actually went to the Australian um, – I think Walden's trying to call us, John. You went to the Australian website, and the gist of it was it actually said they don't – they aren't required to pick the top two finishes from the Olympic trials, which just seems silly. to Like, in the past, they've said if you have the standard at the time of the trials – and you win the trials, you're on the team. And if they're not doing that, it just seems like kind of a messed up system. Why, like, what, what's the point of having an Olympic trials if you're not going to at least guarantee one winner? That's why the U.S. system is so nice. I know that we do have this uncertainty with sometimes people don't get the, tr- the standard. You have to wait. But USATF, we know every year, look, if you are top three with the standard, you're on the team. It, it's that simple. And I understand that other countries don't have that sort of depth in every event, but in terms of, you know, understanding the sport and understanding what's at stake, it makes it a lot simpler for us fans and for us athletes as well. So anyway, that that's the men's mile. I thought it was really, again, Luke Hauser was really impressive, but I still kind of feel like if I had to bet on one of these guys to make the Olympic team this year, I'm probably going Joe Wascom just because a he made the team last year outdoors and b you know Wascom wasn't all that amazing indoors last year. I think he was only fourth and he was much better outdoors. Might have even beaten Nathan Green in the 1500 outdoors if he had been able to get unboxed a little bit more. So he's also I mean I'm not going to say anything like Wascom kind of just has that go for it mentality. We saw it in the US final last year when he goes up and makes that move on to goose. And we're just like, okay, this guy's not afraid of anyone. So yeah, I, I still probably am leaning Wascom if I have to pick the three of them, but Nathan green's got wheels and Luke house is a smart racer. Um, 
So yeah, they're all really good. It's just it's crazy that these three guys all at the same school have won the last four NCAA mile or 1500 titles. Like, do we have to get Robert? I know you don't like it when I give credit to coaches, but do we have to give some credit to Andy Powell for winning four straight across with three different guys in the 1500 a mile? That's incredible. Correct. I was talking to some friends at lunch today about Nick Saban. I mean, he didn't do well in the pros. We didn't have a superior talent advantage, everybody else, but there's no doubt that Nick Saban is a sick, sick coach. And there's no doubt that, you know, Andy Powell is a very good coach. So congrats to him. By the way, I'm looking in the YouTube chats here. Oh, Rose Runner. I was about to criticize Rose Runner. Someone put this comment up. Is Hauser the U.S. version of Tefer, though? Great indoor runner, but not much of a factor outdoors. Maybe he'll prove us wrong. I hope so. Because the next comment from Rose Runner was, am I crazy to be more excited – for Nico to try out a 1500 more than a 10k, his speed or strength, which is helping his speed, his speed. Anyways, and I'm not sure about the second sentence. Yes, there. you are crazy. I Absolutely mean, crazy. The, the only thing interesting about Nico running a 1500, he'd run it as a fitness test. Well, like, no, actually, run, but the way the 1500s run these days, I, look, he wait, no, he's he's not gonna. This guy is not a 1500 runner. He's not, but but Rose, I would like to see someone. I didn't think about it. That mile converts to like three forty nine. Double what? threshold. He's the he's the American Nordos. But Nordos didn't think he had a kick. He said he was the least talented guy ever on a three thirty, and suddenly he's a global medalist. I thought it was the double. Are we thing thinking ever? this is totally wrong? Could Nico Young medal at the Olympics this year in the fifteen? If Johnny Gregoric ran three forty eight in the mile, and Nico's three forty nine, Nico's time converts to what three forty nine, three forty eight. I think Nico could run. At least 333. Yeah, I, I do, but I just, you know, Mo Farah could run 328, and Mo Farah never ran the 1500 at Worlds. And I guess that was in a different environment, but, you know, Nico, I want to see what he could run in the 10K. What are you laughing at, Robert? I can't read the comment out loud on the podcast for posterity. For those of you listening on, no, I'm taking this off the comments. Bro, people, we have over 500 live viewers and you're just posting this garbage. Anyway, and now we've got Kevin LeBlanc going the opposite way. Nico should sign pro and focus on the marathon. I mean, I just I just love it. Nico Young. I tried to get Grand Place to run the marathon last a couple weeks ago. He didn't do it. Great for the content machine here. I mean, Japan just had a guy run 206 off of Hakone Ekaden training. So, um, but... All right, the men's 800. I mean, do we even talk about the men's 800? I was talking to Kyle Merber about this, and we we're just like, wait, 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 wait. Talk about your boy. Oh, Pavesh Khan. Yes. Sorry. This is one of the most amazing stories. This I've is. Heard. Seriously, pull over your car if you're driving. Listen to the story. It's kind of a wild story. The world is, is, is flat. Well, I've, I've been watching this guy race, and he's got a sick kick, and. He closes half of his races wait, with his is, chain in his mouth. He'll like it'll be bound. He races this, with wait, a chain. We're talking about Florida freshman Parvesh Khan from India. Yeah. So he races with a chain and it'll bounce up. And then inevitably it'll bounce up near his mouth and he'll just catch it in his mouth. And then he'll run with it, his teeth down. He'll just breathe through his nose the rest of his race. He did this in winning the SEC title two weeks ago over one of the fastest milers in NCAA history in SSI of South Carolina. So I'm like, this guy's fascinating. And then I read back his backstory. He's from India. He grew up in this remote village. His parents were farmers. They were quite poor, not well-educated. He starts kind of running. It sounds, there's a great profile. We linked to it in the Let's Run recap about him that came out right before the meet. But in India, it's not uncommon for people to train a little bit if they're going to go into the military. I think it's the Navy because there's a fitness test. So he starts doing that, and it turns out he's pretty good. So at the age of 13, he moves to New Delhi, the capital. Wait, 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 wait. Let me interrupt here, John. You're training for the military at age 13? I, I don't know. That was the that was the explanation in the story. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of, maybe he was running with some people who were training for the military. Anyway, he kind of got interested in running. Turns out he's pretty good. He moves to New Delhi at age 13, moves in with his uncle because that's where the training, the stadiums are, the facilities and the coaches. 
he keeps getting better. And then eventually he represents India. He's running on the national team. He comes over to Colorado for an altitude camp and he reaches out. He's got a friend on Instagram who runs the Eastern Kentucky. He says, Hey, I want a scholarship to run in the NCAA. How do I do that? The guy gives him Will Palmer's contact info. Will Palmer, the coach at the University of Florida. And Palmer offers him a scholarship. He comes in. This is his first year in the NCAA. His English is still a work in progress, but he's adjusted wonderfully. He's run 355. He's the only person in the history of India. Listen to this. India has 1.4 billion people. It is the most populous nation on earth. There is only one of those people who has ever broken four minutes in the mile. It's Pavej Khan, this 19-year-old college kid. This guy should get a billion dollars. <laughs> Think how, how unique that is. Maybe a billion rupees. That's a little. We weird. had over a hundred college kids break for no Indians ever done it, and this guy's running through. Like, now, granted, they, they found him and they recruited him, give him a full ride to call. I mean, to Ford. There's not, there's only twelve scholarships. Right. Well, here's the thing: twelve point six. But you, you're going to give a full ride to a freshman distance runner? I wouldn't give that. I I asked Will Palmer about this. I go up to him and I say. Why did you take a chance on this guy? And he kind of looks at me like I'm stupid. He's like, take a chance. This guy ran 147 and 340 at the age of 17. Like, think about how many U.S. high schoolers do that every year. Not a lot. And the ones that do get full rides. No, but I... So, I would, also, you're doing this in India. So, it's not the best training. You know, it's not a country known for producing distance runners. I would, if you're that talented, I, his bet was essentially like, Get him stateside, get him good coaching and good training environment. This guy could take off. And he got seventh in his first NCAA final as a 19 year old true freshman. I'm pretty impressed with him. And he won SECs, right? And he won SECs. And he's got a nice, great I, clothes. I, I'm very impressed, but I would have been thinking about it too negatively. I would have thought, oh, yeah, you're obsessed with the genetics. The genetics. Yeah. There's no one from that continent or whatever that's any good. And I would have thought all these Indian guys, we heard about the drug testers showing up. They're all jumping over the fence. I would assume he's a doped up guy who's not talented. He's never going to get any better. Congrats to him. Cool. I mean, amazing story. Absolutely amazing story. So. um, And the chain. Love the chain. He basically said, oh, it's not even, I don't even think about it. I'm like, how do you breathe? He's like, oh, I just don't, I just breathe through my nose and my mouth. It's fine. So. We, last but not least, we well, have to go to the 800s. We didn't want what to do you mean, last about- but not least? Lost and least. The 800s, just not on the men's side, just not that interesting. We don't need to talk about it very much. We it's, had a guy that got the what place at the SC? Rivaldo Marshall. He's a Juco transfer. He's now at Iowa. It's kind of a cool he, story, though. He, yeah, he was fifth at Big Tens. Fifth. Somehow he wins the NCAA title and does it convincingly on the last lap. But To win 800 by .6. Five of a second is wild. Right. No, he, he won by a lot. And I, but I was talking to Kyle Merber about this. I'm just like, you know, sort of an underwhelming field. Like, we don't have a Will Sumner type guy, or well, from what we can tell. John and- was talking to Kyle Merber, by the way. Can I, can I make fun of Sidious? They could not come to the meet tonight because they had to go to the high school meet. You, you take the cash, you sell your soul, you go to the high school meet. Folks, let's run. We go to the college meet. So, yeah, I mean, these guys, 146 96, and he dominates everyone in the last lap. So, great win for him. I'm excited to see how much better he can get. But this, I'm just not going to spend that much time on this race because it wasn't that interesting. What well, was interesting was the women's 800. Well, real quick about this men's 800 race. As a former coach and as a parent of a, of, a, of a young boy, by the way, tonight's meet was my first, my son's first sporting event. I left briefly in the cup podcast. I was watching live because my wife called me. He's going to bed. He's staying up to 11, 11. He's only going to bed now? Yeah, he was waiting for Chris Lear's daughter, who's at a, been at a bat mitzvah, to come home so he can say goodnight to her. She, he's, he loves Chris's daughter. Wait, She's in seventh oh, grade. hold on a second. Wait, how much older is Chris Lear's daughter than him? She's in seventh grade. He's six. Oh. Half your age plus whatever. Does not wait, a, wait a few years. <laughs> that rule will apply. I mean, if Robert can talk about my love life, is, is your son's this, love life? This is oh, awkward at six years old. Yeah, okay. you don't like that? Oh, yeah. Get <laughs> taste of your own medicine. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, but um, <laughs> wow, lost my train of thought. Uh, You're talking about the men's 800 for some reason. Yeah. So Sean Dolan of Villanova, senior Villanova, is the son of Steve Dolan, the pin, U Penn coach. He back when I was coaching, he was a Princeton coach, so we were kind of rivals. And we did what Robert could not. Won Heps cross country. He would win. Even though country. his background is a decathlete. 
He started coaching distance. Fair enough. He, they would win cross country. We would win in track most years. And, uh, well, my guys did well. I guess this guy's. And, uh, I've, always, I, he, I've always said Steve has – and then he won two cross country titles at Penn, which I never I – mean, total credit to him. Amazing accomplishment. But I was talking to Sean afterwards, and I said, hey, this is your best finish. He's only been fifth before. So, again, I'm really excited. Like what? It's a classic line that you always get. I've done only like one or two 800 meter workouts. I'm a miler. I've been working on my strength. He's a miler, but he's only going to run 800 all year. That's his focus all year, 800. But it was kind of interesting. I said, "Hey, man, because like I, I remember being in this meet, but I don't remember this kids being around. I knew Steve had two kids, two sons who are both good runners, and but I don't remember. I'm like, you know, I'm focused on the conference man. I don't remember seeing kids around them." I'm like, wow, did he come? So I was thinking, like, okay, like, what if my son became a runner? I said, hey, do you talk to your dad about running? Because I've talked to the agent Tom Radcliffe. He's like, I never talked to my son about running when he was younger. Never. He's like, well, now I do. He's like, almost every conversation I have is with my dad. With my dad is about running. But I have great two great mentors. I'm really blessed to have two such smart people advising me. Meaning his dad, who's a Division One coach, and Marcus Sullivan, who is one of the all time Irish Irish great runners. He's like, and normally they gave me the same advice. And then I followed up. I said, hey, what if they don't give the same advice? And I love this because this is a coach's son responding to me. He's like, I signed up for Marcus to be my coach. I'm going to listen to Marcus. So there you have it, parents. You can give your kids advice, but if the head coach has different advice, for the most part, let them listen to that. So it was cool. He's doing well. He was, you know, second. And I'm happy with it. Yeah. All right. Rufus Brevet in the comments. I, somehow I missed this. This is amazing. Safan Hassan is running world cross country. Just ran Tokyo marathon. Didn't go amazing for her. I mean, she gets to Tokyo to Belgrade. That's like more than three weeks. Plenty of time for her to bounce back. But that suddenly makes world cross country so much more interesting. We'll talk about that on the podcast next week. I was kind of worried. I'm going to world cross country. I'm like, is anyone going to show up for this thing? The U.S. team isn't that great. Like, is it going to – Safan and Sam being there makes it so much more interesting. So that's fantastic. By the way, I, I was telling these guys that I met at the meet, I said, I'm filtered on my own website. I put up a comment, Cooper Tears not going. <laughs> and I said, Cooper Tears boycotting his spot, giving up his spot, is only most likely his only spot chance of being on Team USA this year. And Weldon and John made me take it down. Robert just takes pot shots at runners. Like it's saying, a factual comment. It's not a factual comment. It's your opinion. You don't think he's going to make the Olympic team. And I think he's he's got a shot. He's serious. He's a serious I said contender. most likely. What do you mean most likely? According to you, like, I just think it's rude. You want to piss off Kubatia because you no. don't think he's going to make the Olympic team? I mean, I guess I want wanted, him to go to World Cross Country. You wanted to piss off Noah Lyles saying he's not going to win Olympic gold medals. So maybe you just do it for the clout. But I, I just feel like you're. I didn't want to taking... piss him off. I want to. We live in a society where we can't state objective facts that, like, if you have a wee wee, you're a male. And if you don't, you're a female. Oh, my. All right. All right. <laughs> Robert, no more beers for you. We might need to send you in the corner and time out. Well, I can see Weldon in the background. Weldon's laughing. <laughs> Let's talk about the women's 800 meters. This race was fantastic. I'm kind of surprised it took us this long to get to it, but by the way, going on. And this was my favorite female interview of the, of the weekend for me. My favorite male interview, Sean Dillon. Go to YouTube, listen to that. Listen to my Michaela Rose interview after the fact. Julia Whitaker of Stanford. I mean, you had her and Rosine. Um, Rasheem Willis going in. Rasheem Willis won last year. Juliet Whitaker was second. But then outdoors, Michaela Rose clearly surpassed both of them. Whitaker decided to run the 1500 outdoors, didn't even make it to NCAAs. And Rose has just gone up a level. She's been running consistent. She ran, what, 158 a couple weeks ago? Like, I'm looking at this. I'm like, my question isn't, does Michaela Rose win? It's how fast does she run? Can she break a thing most collegiate record? You know, she, she's been fantastic. And she takes it out, 27.9, quick for 200. Robert already, his guard was up. He's like, that's very fast. That's very aggressive for an opening 200. And well, But it was more so when I saw the 800, the 400 split. Like, she's so good. 27.9 might be okay if the next lap is like 28.9 or 29. But if the next lap was 30.4. Yeah, so she comes through 58.33, and Whitaker is right on her. And I'm like, all right, she means business. This is great. And – 
Whitaker's still on her at the bell, and then I'm like, all right, she's still there with 100 to go. She's going to pull by and win. This is how it works in these races usually. And that's how it happened. Whitaker ran a really terrific race. She, it, it's kind of interesting, like 159.53, one of the fastest college times ever. But this wasn't a PB. You know, her overall PB is 159.04. She's the high school record holder. Indoors? No, out, outdoors. Mm-hmm. But that was from 2022 when she was a high school senior. And now this is her fastest time since then. Ju- Whitaker was overjoyed. And Michaela Rose was, you know, she wasn't that down downbeaten about it. Like she... She was upset to lose, right? But she was kind of like, I don't regret what I went. I went for it. And she's been very consistently the 159s. But, you know, she had a plan and she just couldn't run fast enough today. So you you run 159.8 in an NCAA 800 meter final, usually you're going to win. And Michaela Rose did it today and she didn't she didn't win because Juliet Whitaker, who we know is a big talent, i uh, starting to rediscover that talent. And it's not like, you know, she didn't make NCAA outdoors last year. She Ran well indoors. She was second in the in the eight hundred. Anchored the winning DMR. She just hasn't run faster than she did in her incredibly decorated high school career yet. But I was encouraged to see that Whitaker, one of the US's great young talents, seems to be doing well and is now an NCAA individual champion for the first time. And I like to see Rose stay aggressive. And you know, it was a fun race. This was an upset. It was exciting. It was two great talents. Uh, it was terrific all around. I agree. It's so hard because there can only be one winner. And, like, kind of the expectation for the two Stanford girls is, like, win or bust. And only one of them can win. So, like, if you don't win, it's like a failure based on how good they were in high school, which is, like, almost unfair. And yeah, you're you know, the one who's obsessed, so they still PRing when they're age 19. Well, yeah, but. You know, if you look at her Whitaker's performance this year, 202 in January 13th, 430 mile, only seventh place. And then she runs 2 flat 09 at the last chance meet to get into the meet, which she, you know, loses to Nia Aiken. So that was the last two weekends, two weekends ago. And, and now, you know, she's the winner. But I love the quote from Rose. She said, you know, she wanted to win, obviously, and she's like, I love her. She's amazing. I was in high school watching her. So she was like a fan. And I don't know. Like, my six-year-old son has a hard problem, like, losing. Like, he just has to win every time. If I beat him in something, it's like, it doesn't count. The rules are broken. So I'll let him win. I, I never thought I'd be the parent that let him win. I'll let him win, like, 80, 8 out of 10 times. Then once out of 10, I'll have to beat him. But I just, like – if he was a little bit older, I would show him the Michaela Rose interview. And I still think her tactics were not great. I think that there should have been – you got to have a more even split between two and four. But she might have lost anyways. Yeah. You know, very encouraging by Whitaker. I don't think Rose – like, again, running 159 in an NCAA final indoors, that's, that's a good run. All right. We need to – oh, Robert's favorite, Lisa, is offering comments. All right. I, I've been up since 4 in the – well, 4.30 in the morning because I'm still in Europe time, Robert. I was – remember I was flying back yesterday. So we're going to need to wrap this up because we've still got some articles to write. But I, I guess we should mention the person who's the, the most likely to win an Olympic medal from this entire meet. We haven't said his name yet. Christopher Morales Williams of Georgia won the 400. This guy set the quote unquote world record at SECs, but didn't get ratified because he didn't have electronic starting blocks. Tonight, he runs 44 67. Again, one of the fastest times in NCAA history. Gets the win. Had to run that fast, actually. Ahmad Robinson of Texas AM, 44 91, was second. That's a legit time. But Can someone tell me how he's in the slow heat? Like, what did he run yesterday? So I was asking him about this. I think the way he explained it was the – it's not as much about slow heat versus fast heat. It's about getting the preferential lanes, which are five and six, puts you in better position to get the break, basically. So he was saying, like, if you are – if you win or if first and second in the – or sorry, the top four times in the prelims, I think get – Five and six, either in heat one or heat two. I, I don't. I think that was his explanation. But he was basically like, "Look, 
I just wanted to be in lane six. He didn't really care which heat he was in because he knew he was going to run fast and he got it done. The interesting thing about Morales Williams, he's only 19. He's Canadian. I said, why do you think you made such an improvement? He'd run 45-8, sorry, 45-3 last year outdoors, which is very good for a freshman in college. But now he's running 44-4 indoors. If you're running 44-4 indoors, you can probably run 44 flat or under. And these days that's enough to maybe win the gold medal at a global championships. So, I mean, 44 flat or under outdoors. So I've been super impressed by with him, but I was like, why, you know, why do you think you got better? He's like, well, this is kind of the first year I've really been training like year round for this event and doing like base stuff in the fall. Like you are saying in high school, there were co- the COVID lockdowns essentially prevented him from having, having track access. It was kind of hard to tell because the audio was really loud for a second. I was like, he mentioned something about it being cold in Canada in the winter and getting outdoor track access. I'm not sure, but for whatever reason, only now that he's in college, he's really been able to sort of take this sport seriously all the way through the year. And the results are paying off. Clearly he's a humongous talent. So a well-deserved NCAA title. I'm excited to see where he goes from here. And what was the time, John? 44-67. Alexander Doom. Guys, yeah, he didn't win its heat yesterday. His you guys weren't at the meet. That he won the title. It's 45. Some guy beat him to the turn. If you don't, if you get beat to the, the way, turn, the won the world title really hard to yeah. last week. By the way, the four by four tonight was faster than what Belgium ran to win the U.S. I always say no. we should just send the top college team to win. Walton Johnson has joined us live. We can't hear him for some reason, but he I think he has something to say. You can't hear me. We can't hear you, Weldon. Angry Weldon Johnson, folks. Apologize for the. Technical difficulties? We've never had that on this We've show never before. Ne- never been a problem of any kind. Yurik um, Kerr. Oh, my God. Yurik Kerr. That's a fake name, right? You can't hear me? Robert, what do you th- – look, you, do you honestly believe – that's a fake name, right? You have to ask me. That you think that we have someone called Yarid Kerr listening to the show. That's the actual birth name. Well, how do you get that Oh, name shoot. They can hear him? Oh, it must be on our end, then. It's because we don't have a – yeah, this has been a reason you haven't been on the show. Let me try here. Oh, do sp- that one. All right, well then. <laughs> try again. Hey guys. Can you guys hear me? No, nope, sorry. Don't I'll just talk I'll just talk to everybody out there. I mean Wow. The show no, we're not gonna try a podcast where <laughs> You say something and we can't even hear what you're saying. Then we're going to go off the rails a couple of times. I apologize. They weren't even at the meet yesterday. They can't hear what I'm saying. Oh, wait a second. All right. One more time. You guys hear me now? Yes, you yes. can. Yes. Wow. Okay. Wow. Um, I was saying he didn't even win his heat yesterday. He got beat to the 200 and. It's really hard to pass indoors. That's the thing people don't realize. It's a circle. Indoors, like you don't realize that the track's a circle. I thought no, I thought I outdoors, the distance, the the amount of distance you're losing indoors each turn is the same. You're losing outdoor track being in lane two. You're losing it twice as quickly, the same amount of distance. So an, under 400 meters, you're going to lose double the distance you would lose indoors. The radius of the turn is the same. It's still two circles. Is that true. Like, yes, running in lane two is just idiotic indoors. That's why I think Hauser's really good at, at this type of stuff. But, yeah, I think they take the first guy and the second seed, put him in the first seed. They put the third and fourth guy in the next seed, it's, and then they fill in the other seed. So, like, even though he didn't win, I think it's fine to be the third guy because you're going to get the best lane in the next heat. I think that's how it works. And, John, do you know Terrence Jones' PRs? I mean, the dude's... I just had him here a second ago. 645 he ran last year? 991 in 1987? I mean, those are six times. He could be at the Olympics. Those are really good, but I also, I feel like you got a bit of inflation with Austin. That track, like, it's just hot and that's track, the fast, the track's really fast. Like, I do want, anyone who runs fast at NCAAs in Austin, I kind of wanted to see them do it outside of there. 
But yeah, no, Ter- I mean, Terrence Jones, you sweep the 60 and the 200 NCAAs. No one has done that since 2018. It's very, it's impressive. But do you know the name of the last guy to do it? It's Elijah Hall of Houston, who hasn't really amounted to doing anything as a professional. But the guy who did it before him was Christian Coleman. And Christian Coleman's obviously had a great professional career. So can, can, can I say one thing? He runs for Texas Tech. They won the team title today. And I was really excited when Texas Tech, like the underdog story when they won in Austin a few years ago. But the whole thing in Austin, the, the, their headliner was the 100 200 meter champion. Help me out with his name, John. Divino Daduru. And he got popped for drugs. And I'm like, they should, they, they, I'm assuming he didn't just get on drugs when he became a pro. Like they should have the head coach should give that this that that title back and all the bonus money and all that. So I, I'm not saying anything now. They like I actually loved his interview. You can watch it on YouTube. They've got a culture. The guys love each other. There's a great sprint crew, but it still just bothers me. It's like okay, I'm assuming if Devard, Devine was cheating as a pro, he cheated in college and he won an NCAA team title for that team for that team. Whatever. By the way, I, I'm I was at the meet. I didn't realize this. Apparently, a high, U.S. high schooler Dan Simmons has run thirteen thirty-eight. That's Japanese territory. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, it's impressive. I mean, we have had high schoolers run that fast even last year. Two of them ran faster right. outdoors. Right. Who? Connor Burns and didn't one of the young brothers? We we the NCAA the U.S. high school five k record was broken twice last year outdoors within a span of a couple weeks. Um, so 1338, I mean, it is really good run for Daniel Simmons, but it's also the days of my mind being blown by a U.S. high schooler running 1338. Uh, I mean, they're gone. It's just something I think that top high schooler probably is going to be able to do that every fair, year. Fair enough. Fair enough. By the way, according to Chicago Field News, Lux Young, 1334 last year, Connor Burns, 1337. Galen Rupp, pre-super series, 1337. It's pretty good. All right. Uh, so. We need to end this show because we still have some work to do. And well, John, we got to get – the viewers are going up. People are enjoying me drinking, I think, tonight. Probably I the guy, know. probably the guys that invited me out to the bar gave up me showing up and are now on the podcast with all the women at the bar. John, Lisa's wearing a swimsuit. All right, on. everyone. Need to we know Lisa – Loves you, Rojo. She so. loves John. Okay. I'm a married man. Lisa. Thank what you, everyone. John? Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back I mean, with the regular show on Tuesday. And then the next time we do one of these sort of post-meet shows, it's probably going to be World Cross. Well, you know World Cross, the final race at World Cross is like 6, 10 p.m. in Belgrade. It's going to be in like in the evening. It's kind of uh, getting excited. So, so what time will that be? Yeah, it's about like 1 o'clock. Perfect. It'll be like noon U.S. time on sun on a Saturday. I gotta go. I gotta go back to Belgrade. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in on a Saturday night. Really appreciate it. Uh, this is a, actually a great live crowd. I mean, if, if we do our podcast at a more reasonable hour, this was more popular than any of the world indoor streams, right? People just care world about. Said it. I don't know. People in the comments, can you comment right now? Do you prefer like NCAs over world indoors? John, why don't you go write the recap? I'm going to start politics. We've got Trump versus Biden. What do you think of that? Oh, good lord. We've got tr- – I know, Robert, I can't do anything. I go anywhere in public. Robert just inserts race or gender into basically everything we do. Trump versus Biden? Some guy racist. was rude to me on the street, and Robert immediately starts trying to turn this into like a culture war thing, and I'm just like, Robert, we don't need to go there. Okay? This is a liberal that's, that's triggered. I said Trump versus Biden. John said I was talking about race and gender. No, what? no, no. I'm saying you talk about that stuff. I know that's where the segue goes. You'll start talking about that, and then it will go into race and gender because you can't help. You already talked about the gender thing earlier in the show. I, I did not. You had Yes, you did. Weldon was laughing about it. It could have been easily avoided. It was totally unnecessary. Well, anyway. No one talks. It's very sad to me. No one talks about religion anymore, but they talk about gender, which is religion. So. I'm going to make the black t-shirt with the white wiring sex. Okay. All right. Pound sex, not gender. That's all I say. And the, and the money will go to the Raleigh Gaines. <laughs> okay. We're cutting Robert off. Uh, he's had three beers. It's clearly too much. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll be back with the regular show on Tuesday. So long.